social reform, ensuring justice, changing the way that society is working and operating towards the vulnerable, towards the marginalized and the oppressed and the weak. This is an intrinsic part of what it means to worship God. Jesus is saying, we need to be doing both. Don't preach and neglect our neighbor. Well, hello and welcome to About Abortion. I'm Beth Davey and I'm joined once again by my co-host, Tim Lewis. And on today's episode, we will be thinking about social reform and the New Testament. Do we see the early church as social reformers? Can we claim that social reform is a part of what it means to be a New Testament believer? Or is there even a biblical justification for social reform? But before we go into that, Tim, welcome. Um, can you explain why we are responding to the um, episode that Building Jerusalem put out, their podcast episode, uh, the very short podcast we did last week that uh, Dave encouraged people to go and listen to it. Would you just set that context for us, please, before we start, Tim? Sure. Uh, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Beth. I will I will paint the scene um, for folks and give a little bit of the backstory. I might just do that vis-a-vis -vis this podcast and also then that the wider Keswick story. <laughs> people may be fed up of hearing about Keswick, actually, but um, I think it's helpful to see it in context. So, yeah, so so in case anyone doesn't know, um, a couple of weeks ago, or just over a couple of weeks ago, there was a podcast um, by a guy called Stephen Neal. Uh, his podcast and blog is called Building Jerusalem. Uh, has some has some good content on there. I've been to to have a look at it. Um, so so Stephen put out uh, a podcast with um, it was himself and a fellow contributor, uh, another sort of uh, church leader, church planter in the northwest. They're based in the northwest of England. Um, so it was Stephen Neal and a guy called Stephen Watkinson. And their podcast was really looking at the issue of our disagreement, as in uh, Brefos, our disagreement recently with the Keswick Convention uh, after Brefos held a display, a public display, a public education display in the town uh, during one of the convention weeks. And um, obviously, Keswick goes on for about three weeks. Uh, and, and we were there during that time. So what we want to do today is to kind of respond to their podcast which was responding to this whole story really um we're very grateful for their interest we're, we're very grateful when anyone uh sort of engages with us as a ministry although we do have some concerns really some major concerns actually about the content of the podcast primarily some of the arguments that were made on it as well as the way uh the whole kind of keswick affair was was reported um I did reach out to, to Stephen Neal coming up to two weeks ago. It'll be on Thursday. And again, more recently, to see if we could collaborate on a podcast, either one of us to go on his or he, him to come on ours, etc. And we're still very willing to do this. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had any response from, from Stephen to this offer. But we again, we're willing to do that in the future. However, because we think that the podcast raises some some points and objections that other Christians may be wrestling with, we thought it was helpful to address some of the points um, this podcast raised and, and to kind of to respond to some of that. Before we come to the to the podcast, let me just initially say a few words about what happened in in Keswick itself, because the way it's been reported isn't um, necessarily accurate in, in the way it's come across. Um, the podcast as well sort of suggested that Keswick didn't want to associate themselves with us which was true but it was a bit more than that they directly asked us not to come we we mentioned as a courtesy really that we were going to be in the town at such and such a time uh and, and do one of our displays we didn't need to do that but we wanted to kind of yeah as a courtesy we thought that would be good they asked us in no uncertain terms to stay away so at no point have they supported um us in this ministry they repeatedly declared themselves saddened by our actions, um, which we'll, we'll come on to that, really, what, what that means, really. They were very delighted to work with the police, but they were saddened by what um, we as fellow believers were doing. Now, as the podcast suggests, um, there's no expectation that Keswick should host or promote us or any other Christian ministry for that matter. But I think we were surprised at the forcefulness of Keswick, Keswick Convention's response 
and just how unwilling really they were to engage with us. Um, I think what also disappointed us was the fact that they were very willing, um, a little bit too willing, I think, to believe every report, every rumour that was being circulated on social media or by word of mouth by folks from the town or whoever really regardless of the source regardless of the motives rather than actually listen to the testimony of those christians who were there uh, including a pastor who was on part of the display um and i was thinking it's a bit like uh, in the new testament where we, we may come to this story as we go but things really kick off in in the book of acts in chapter 19 things really kick off in ephesus um, and imagine if some Christians in another part of Asia Minor heard about things and they wanted to kind of get to the bottom of, of this riot. Uh, they heard about what was going on because um, they were a bit concerned about how this might affect their sort of ministry, their outreach. But imagine if those Christians uh, somewhere else in Asia Minor decided, well, rather than speak to Paul and those who are with him, we're only going to speak to Demetrius and his fellow silversmiths. We're only going to speak to those who've <laughs> who've been offended by the Christian work, uh, really riled up about it. Uh, we won't bother to ask Paul um, what really happened. It, it's it's an odd way to go about things, but but that seems to be really how Keswick went about getting their version of events. Now, Keswick do not. Well, the Keswick Convention don't own the town of Keswick. They do not have a monopoly on Christian work within the town, even within convention weeks. Obviously, it's a big, you know, it's a big happening, but, the, you know, they don't own the town. There's no reason why other Christian groups would not engage. Uh, conventioners would not seek to be there during the convention. Not least, I think, so there was a lot of talk about a sort of piggybacking on the Keswick Convention, whatever that quite means. Well, we we don't pretend that Christians are not our key sort of demographic. You know, we want to engage, we want to work with the, the church, the local church. So, and we do that throughout the year, not just during the Keswick Convention. Um, and our survey work as part of the display in Keswick was intended primarily for Christian respondents, for those who'd been at the convention. So um, this was less about us piggybacking on, on, on the Keswick Convention, more about us sort of tapping into our, in many ways, our target audience there, uh, as we do. 52 weeks of the year now let me say a word about keswick and their sort of pro-life stance because they they've regularly mentioned their pro-life credentials i think we do have to ask some questions about that uh, in terms of how that actually manifests itself in practice what have they done for the pro-life cause uh, in recent times last year's uh, convention was themed human um just looking at the kind of question of human existence human life what does it mean to be a, a human in today's fairly confused world what better opportunity one might think to to look at the killing of over a quarter of a million human beings every year in this country alone however and we and we asked we we made various sort of approaches to keswick to see if we could be engaged uh, particularly in 2023 when that was the theme they Again, they weren't. Um, that, they didn't see that as part of their thing. Again, that's fine. But the sum total of their pro-life content, um, as far as I, as far as we can tell, uh, last year seemed to be one guest lecture over the course of the three weeks um, by Celia Wyatt, which first of all was very hard to find online. I think for a long time it wasn't accessible, and the lecture itself had some good aspects, but. More problematic of which was the fact that it supported non-directive pregnancy counselling, okay, which is a big kind of term. But what that really means is that pregnancy counselling, often offered by churches or sort of satellite uh, organisations working with churches, supporting women um, who are pregnant um, and kind of offering them a full menu of options, really, among which is abortion, abortion access. So... For a pro-life uh, ministry, for a pro-life talk to support and promote non-directive pregnancy counselling that would result in many cases in, 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 in women accessing abortion and children being killed is, is quite a strange definition, I would suggest, of, of a pro-life message. So I think there's some issues there with, with Keswick's kind of their, their, their pro-life credentials. Um, just finally, in terms of the actual display, the imagery used we 
did not use imagery of abortion victims on this occasion, so we, we showed no pictures of, of children who had been aborted. We simply displayed uh, a picture, a large picture of an unborn child in the womb at a fairly early stage of gestation. Um, beautiful image, but really the sort of image you could find very easily online in a medical textbook, uh, on a scientific documentary, for example. An image showing the beauty of God's creation, and I think drawing attention to the reality of what terminating, to use the euphemism, such a life really means. This isn't just a, a, a blob of cells or a clump of tissue. This is a unique, um, fearfully and wonderfully made human being. And a human being like this is killed in every single abortion. So every time someone has an abortion, this is the kind of human life that is ended uh, deliberately in that in that abortion, and, and the responses were were pretty were pretty. Um, many of the townsfolk, anyway, not every, not all of them are by any means, but the responses were quite sort of strong, and I think they were strong because people realised when 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 the sort of euphemisms are pulled away, we realise what abortion actually does and the life it, it ends, I think that's difficult. That pricks the conscience, that, that causes, you know, confronts one with uh, the behaviour, um, maybe the people have been involved in the past, the lies that our culture are sort of feeding folks all the time. So yes, it brings people to a bit of a point of ethical moral crisis, but I would say that's an opportunity for uh, Christians to point people to, to Jesus Christ, who is, essentially our only hope uh, in life and in death um, for uh, he's the only one who can save. Um, so so that's a little bit about the imagery. Now, so just to, to respond to questions raised in the Building Jerusalem podcast, so, so when uh, Stephen said, was what they did legitimate, meaning was what we did legitimate, I would say yes. Was what they did necessary? Again, this is the, the, his words. Well, yes, unless drawing attention to the quarter of a million deaths every year in the UK is is not necessary. And then finally, uh, is it good? Is it helpful? Well, this slightly begs the question is for whom is it good and helpful? Is it good and helpful for the unborn children who are being killed in such numbers? Um, well, I guess so. Anything that sh sort of shines a light on their plight is helpful. One of the things about the Keswick Convention's response, which unfortunately I think was reflected in uh, the Building Jerusalem podcast was that the unborn ch child, the, the victims of abortion barely get a mention really. They're sort of airbrushed out of the debate, even though ostensibly this is what the debate's about. Um, is it helpful for Christians then? Well, well, yes, I believe it is. And despite the podcast, um, so, so I think Stephen Neal says at the near the beginning of the podcast, you know, well, of course the church or think abortion are wrong, or words to that effect. Well, unfortunately, we know that that simply isn't true. Um, there simply isn't this widespread consensus in the UK church on the wrongness of abortion. If that was the case, we wouldn't see things like we saw in the recent Evangelical Alliance survey before the election, where 14, fully 14%, so more than one in eight uh, self-described evangelicals said they would actually vote against a party or candidate that sought to um, reduce the time limit for which abortions were available. So not not to, not to ban abortion or anything like this, you know, the kind of scare things we hear about, oh, it's going to, you know, Roe v. Wade and all this, but to move it simply from perhaps 24 weeks to 22 weeks, more than one in eight would be so presumably angered by that, that they would not vote. So these are the these are the evangelical Christians we're talking about when we say, well, everyone believes abortion's wrong. No, they don't. Um, and then is it helpful for, for the townspeople of Keswick themselves to see such an image? Well, I think it is because we know, Beth, that one in three women have an abortion at some point in their lives. So how, why would it be the case that creating awareness of such a widespread issue would not be helpful or or as i've said even a stepping stone in some way to a realization of of sin of guilt of moral culpability and by god's grace 
um, to repentance. So that was a little bit about what we were doing in, in Keswick. Now, as I say, Stephen Neal on his, on his podcast was very much, well, we're with you in terms of the message, in terms of the issue. We are pro-life. We are anti-abortion. And, you know, that was great to hear. But then again, it, what does that actually mean in practice? That's our question. And I think his issue with what we did was very much around tactics. So I think he's he would say that, or they would say, their issue was with the tactics, the way we go about this. Um, you know, are our tactics extra biblical? Or do we see them anywhere in the Bible, for example? And, and I, we're going to get, we're going to kind of deal with this in the in the body of the podcast but but i think just just briefly i would say at the at the outset that in the new testament you know christianity does not happen in a corner in those great words from from the book of acts you know jesus was not killed in the corner and nor does the church uh, grow evangelize interface with the rest of the world with pagan society in a corner it's all out there in the public square and i think if you read the book of acts you see that very clearly um you know, when Paul um, exercises the slave girl in Philippi, Acts 16, it's a very public event. It causes all sorts of public backlash. Um, when Paul, the idol trade we've mentioned, in the, in the idols of Silvus, of uh, Artemis, sorry, in um, Acts 19, again, it's a very public debate. It involves sort of law and order, riots, all the rest of it. Um, so are we actually aping the world, world's tactics, uh, as I think was one of the sort of quotes from the podcast. Well, I don't think we are. I think it would be more accurate actually to say that the Keswick Convention and sort of establishment Christia Christianity generally, they are the ones who, if, if anyone, are aping the world's tactics in the name of political correctness, you know, not wanting to offend, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then I think before I hand back over to you, Beth, I just want to very briefly touch on a couple of the an analogies uh, that were sort of thrown our way in the podcast because because they were really were extraordinary, particularly one which cast us as the kind of um, in the role of the IRA. Um, so so the argument being or the sort of analogy being made was one can agree with a cause, a cause can be legitimate, but the tactics to achieve that may not be. So in this case, sort of, various groups might be working peacefully for Irish unification but it was only the IRA that were working towards that same cause but terrorizing and murdering people along the way so so <laughs> so in the analogy we are very much I'm afraid in the role of the IRA which was pretty unfortunate I think to say the least are we really akin to the IRA are we a sort of pro-life IRA whatever that even means you know how can one be pro-life and IRA they were about killing people um their political offspring I would argue have been generally very pro-abortion once you legitimize the murder of of innocent civilians why would you have any problem with abortion anyway secondly perhaps a slightly more understandable comparison is is that we were akin to just stop oil okay the, the campaign group just stop oil which at least is not a terrorist organization as, as far as i'm aware um but again even then it's it's it breaks down because just stop oil they spread chaos they deliberately make life as difficult as possible for people that's their sort of modus operandi breath or cbr particularly cbr display posters no one is forced to look no one is forced to engage, to talk with those they meet on the streets. We don't make people late for work. We don't stop them getting uh, to a doctor's or a hospital appointment. We generally don't cause chaos for people. We want people to repent, not simply to get riled up. Um, as Gavin Ashenden on this whole kind of climate debate recently said, when discussing climate change, there is some doubt about the future of the weather. But there is no doubt about the coming judgment. And I think that is the way we would approach uh, this issue. Nor is there any doubt about the number of lives being lost every year. As, as I say, in the UK, the last year we have the solid data for 2022, 252,122 children killed. And that number is kind of steadily increasing year on year. So it's hard to think 
of another ethical issue that comes close to abortion in terms of not just numbers, but in terms of moral uh, magnitude. So I hope that sets the scene a, a little bit for folks in terms of the issue, the presenting issue, which was our work at Keswick, and then how uh, the Building Jerusalem podcast responded to, to it and how we're sort of responding to them now. Thanks, Tim. Um, and so as you said, today we want to kind of talk about one of their points. We don't want to go into a um, a whole defending our own ministry. We've we've already discussed this, why we were there, the reasons behind that. So people can go back and listen to the episode that you did with Dave uh, talking about that if they're interested. So what we actually wanted to do was take some of the arguments given in this podcast, which um, could very well be representative of how many Christians are thinking through these issues, um, thinking through the actions, whether they act on their pro-life belief or whether they just keep it as their personal belief um, and just preach the gospel. And one of the things that was said was that um, in the New Testament, we don't see people campaigning protesting, mounting legal campaigns uh, in the Bible. And so the priority of the church today should follow the priority of and the example of the church in the New Testament, uh, which was primarily uh, locally preaching the gospel, locally teaching the gospel, and with the ethical implications that came, just doing good where we are. Um, I think we would agree, wouldn't we, Tim? We we do agree that we don't see people campaigning or mounting legal activism or getting people to write letters to the emperor. Um, we don't see that in the New Testament. So we do agree in that sense. Um, it's not in the New Testament. But does that mean that any kind of social reform is therefore extra biblical? I think that's kind of the question that we want to address today. Are there... Um, biblical justifications for actually going forward and challenging um, ethical issues in public, um, outside of the church, seeking to change laws um, or change society around us uh, for the better. Um, so that's what we're going to dive into today. Um, I would say no social reform isn't extra biblical. I believe you would as well, Tim. <laughs> um, I, think it, I think it is actually fundamental to God's message to his people um, throughout the scripture. So from beginning to the end, uh, there's no change between Old Testament and New Testament. It seems to be God's heart and his message to his people continually that defending the weak and the vulnerable, standing up against injustice, is intrinsic to what it means to love God and love neighbor. And we remember, don't we, that Jesus said, on this hangs all of the law and the prophets. Um, I think kind of backtracking a bit here, you know, being part of uh, being God's image bearers, bearing God's image. Uh, you've got the ancient Near Eastern idea of an idol, an image, which represented the, the ancient uh, God's rule and reign and um presence in a society and, and god comes in and says you shall not make an image of god because he has already made his image he's already created his image in us he's already placed us on the earth to extend and represent his rule and his reign on the earth and given us that camp that cultural mandate to go forth to take dominion of the earth to extend that rule and reign and so we as image bearers have this responsibility to represent God's justice and God's righteousness on the earth, extending his rule in the world. So loving God, as we seek to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength, is representing his justice and his righteousness here on earth. And from that flows out our love to neighbour as ourselves as well. You can't love God, um, love his laws, love his righteousness and just, just, justice. Um, you can't see his holiness and therefore ignore the plight of your neighbour. 
And so I think that's important. We constantly see this in the in the Old Testament, don't we, that you have laws prohibiting gathering crops to the edge of the field so that the poor can gather some for themselves. Um, in a slave culture, there are laws prohibiting the kidnap and selling of other image bearers. Uh, you have the Jubilee landlord laws where uh, people who have had to sell their land in order to pay back debts, their land is reverted back to them so that people don't become poorer and poorer. Um, so, so we see it can go on that God not only requires his people to represent his justice, but he also gives them specific examples as how how can we do this in the world it's not just enough to say yeah i agree i think um god is righteous and just and then not do anything about it Th these have practical implications now of course god's people don't always obey him um and we see the role of the prophets in the coming to call god's people back to him to repentance uh, we see even when they are obeying the sacrificial codes and the worship codes and um, the ritual practices that God instituted, even when they're obeying these things, when it's not coupled with justice, God sees these acts as hypocritical. They can perform the motions and yet their hearts are far from him. Um, this is a famous passage, uh, Amos chapter 5, verses 21 and 24. We always hear the last verse, but just to have it in that context, I think is really helpful, where God says to his people, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never ending stream. And so we see that, you know, social reform, ensuring justice, changing the way that society is working and operating towards the vulnerable, towards the marginalized and the oppressed and the weak. This is an intrinsic part of what it means to worship God. And I think it's very important that God himself shows you can't separate out worship from social reform or the work and what it means to be the people of God from transforming society and moving towards those who are vulnerable and oppressed and marginalized. That they work together and when we separate them out, God says, no, I won't accept your worship when you're ignoring your neighbor. But we see in the Bible as well that this call to repent from evil and injustice isn't just for those within the people of God, but he actually calls for change in pagan nations as well. And we all know Jonah was a prophet that was sent to the pagan nation of Nineveh, which was, you know, a secular society as it were um and he tells them to repent and reform or else they will experience the judgment of god so we know that justice and righteousness the ethical implications of god's kingdom isn't just for his people but they have implications for unbelieving nations pagan nations secular nations we can seek justice and righteousness we can seek the good and well-being of others even in societies that aren't following God. And I think that's quite an important aspect, um, which is raised not just in uh, the Building Jerusalem podcast, but around us today, don't we? We hear that you can't force your ethical beliefs on other people. You can't um, expect other people to accept Christian morality or Christian ethics. Well, if it's the good for the good and well-being of people, if this is what God commands, we have a duty. We, we, we need to be calling people to change their ways and to act in accordance with what God has commanded, regardless of whether they are God's people or secular societies. And again, we have examples of men and women who served in pagan administrations and actually shaped and changed the laws to protect people from genocide or to help the poor, particularly when there was food poverty 
or to allow for religious freedom for God's people in secular and idolatrous nations. Just think of Joseph in Egypt or Esther um, saving her people from genocide or Daniel going into the lion's den so that his people can have religious freedom to pray to the God um, even within the nation of Babylon. So these Old Testament examples, we will be coming to the New Testament, but I don't think that they can be ignored. We can't just say because we are a new people, um, none of these bear any relevance for us anymore. And we see Jesus continually quoting from the New Te- from the Old Testament because the New Covenant doesn't do away with the Old Covenant, but it's a fulfillment of what is in that Old. Uh, in Matthew chapter 9 and 12, Jesus twice quotes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, where God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he's challenging the um, religious leaders of his day, isn't he, that just to worship, to be doing the law, to be seeking after holiness, but in such a way that you become hyper-focused on on the ritual acts of what you're doing um, and at the expense of other people isn't the heart of God, what God wants. It's not the heart of the gospel. And again, the same challenge of the prophets is heard in Jesus's ministry. It's not, well, the prophets were for the old covenant, Jesus is for the new covenant. It, there's a synergy here of a continuation that you know Jesus is calling the people not to be consumed with the letter of the law and miss the heart of what it means to actually do mercy to love justice and Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the scribes um, when they're tithing their dill and their mint and you know even their herbs they're giving a tenth to the um, to the temple but he says, doesn't he, that they neglect the weightier issues of the law, justice and mercy. And he says that they should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So it's not about whether you're uh, truly worshipping, being the people of God, preaching the word, sharing the gospel or doing mercy and social reform and bringing justice. Jesus is saying we need to be doing both. Don't preach and neglect our neighbor. So we need to be doing both. And just before I pass it back over to you, I just wanted to kind of finish on that great commission. Um, I think in, in the Building Jerusalem podcast, they they talked about this, um, talking about what is the mission of the church? Well, we've been given authority to go and preach and teach, which is true. We, you know, the great commission is Jesus's instructions to his followers. Um, But part of that preaching and teaching is teaching people to do everything that Jesus commanded. So there there are practical implications of the Great Commission. Even the very idea of disciple making in itself is not just training people on how to think correctly, but actually then that outworking in their lives. What does that mean to then Um, love God with their mind and their body it's not a sacred secular divide in that sense but we are holistically uh, you know body and spirit and so we have to serve God both spiritually and physically in the world around us and so I think actually that great commission in disciple making is teaching people how to think biblically on all these issues that are going to be coming up in the world around them Um, How do we then deal with these? How can we respond um, in a Christ-like way to everything that's going on? Um, And I think that's actually a reiteration of the creation mandate at the very beginning, you know, going forward, taking God's rule and dominion um, and seeking to extend the kingdom of God in the world around us, uh, which includes social reform, which includes moving towards those who are vulnerable and preventing people from harming them, uh, preventing people from killing. Uh, It's not just a good thing to think privately or a good thing to believe amongst our own personal group, but actually it's a command in scripture and, and Jesus continues to 
reiterate the need for justice, the need to show mercy. Um, and then he gives his authority to us to continue to extend that kingdom. So that's just a, a very, very brief summary of kind of what I believe is the biblical basis for for justice and, and social reform. Um, there's many more verses that we could go to, but Tim, maybe you could kind of move us on into just the early church in general um, and, and what it looked like uh, to do social reform in the early church. Indeed, did the early church engage in social reform or were they just um, hyper-localized and private um, Yeah, sure, but thank you. So, so what what we're saying is 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 that God, God has a people, doesn't he? God has a people through, through whom he extends his mission, uh, or through whom the mission of God um, is kind of taken forward in the world, and and God's kingdom advances. Now, there's a people in the Old Testament, there's a people in the New Testament, but it's the one people of God. That's the one mission of of God, really. Um. And in New Testament parlance, it's about being salt and light, isn't it? So so we would never say here at Brefos that um, kind of pro-life ministry is the, is the church's one mission or, or the mission of God sort of equates to pro-life ministry. What we're saying rather is, is that sort of pro-life ministry, pro-life activism is part of uh the mission of god's people it's it, it's a strand of discipleship it's part of what you know speaking out against injustice defending the weak and vulnerable in society being salt and light in a in a in a you know culture of death it's part of what that looks like um so just that there will be christians who are active in you know like anti-poverty campaigns more broadly or child trafficking or, or sort of racism that kind of thing so we're saying it's very legitimate for Christians to be thoroughly uh, involved and immersed in a, in a pro-life ministry and pro-life activism. That is that is part of the broader mission of God, part of God's kingdom purposes. Um, yeah, and so it's that sort of salt and light. Um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's you know Jesus doesn't command the, commend the Samaritan because he has the right beliefs. He commends him for going and doing something about um the injustice that he sees his neighbor experiencing we see this appalling injustice that our neighbors are experiencing um our unborn neighbors are experiencing and we want to do something about that we want to open everyone's eyes to that injustice but we also want to motivate and stir up the people of god to take this seriously uh, and see it as part of their mandate as you've as you've explained um but yeah, so so the resources are there within the Old and New Testament uh, to engage in this kind of uh, work, in this kind of ministry, in this kind of social reform. And when you then extend the frame of reference um, a little wider to include how the early church lived sort of beyond the apostolic period, we see very clearly that the earliest Christians very much lived out their faith in society and challenged the sort of manifold evils they were confronted with um whether that was in the gladiatorial games sort of prostitution slavery and also the exposure of newborn babies what we call infanticide as well as abortion so and the early church again there's a continuity here they were very much running with traditional themes in the jewish critique of of, of pagan culture and we see some of that in, in kind of romans one in sort of paul's uh, blasting of, of sort of a godless society so the jewish writers philo and josephus both uh, very much condemned abortion both saw it as equivalent to infanticide um and then a, a lot of the time this writing called the didache is mentioned and i would say the didache is the most important early christian writing outside of the new testament um it just means teaching and it compares the way of life with the way of death in terms of dating the Didache, possibly um, late first century, uh, at the very latest, very early second century. So it's within the apostolic generation or certainly within living memory of the apostolic generation. And again, it condemns in no uncertain terms both abortion and infanticide by exposure. It sees them as essentially the same kind of murderous act at, 
but committed against the child at different stages of the, that child's development. And that perspective, it's not unique to Didache. A number of early Christian writings, such as the Epistle of Barnabas, um, make the same point. Uh, something called the Apocalypse of Peter, which is a very kind of graphic um, sort of imagination of, of, of hell, um, sees abortion as one of the one of the key sort of sins that people are mired in 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 that in that culture and time. So we very much see that the early church directly responding to this culture of death. Um, and one of the ways they did that was in taking these abandoned children um, into their homes and, and, and raising them as their own, a sort of kind of proto-orphanage type ministry, really. Many of these children who were exposed, what would have, if they didn't die, if they survived at all, they'd often have been taken into sort of brothels and raised to be sort of prostitutes when they were older. Uh, they were often a, a disproportionate number of baby girls were abandoned compared to, to baby boys. So this is the kind of culture that the church is, is operating in. And I think it's really important as well to say that the early church interpreted the Lord's words about receiving little children, welcoming little children, extending hospitality to little children, as if to Christ himself, actually. Um, and, th and that teaching occurs in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. They interpret that as having application for just these sorts of issues. Um, and arguably, the, the evangelists chose their vocabulary in these in, in these sort of um these pericope to highlight the contrast between jesus embracing and placing his hands upon children um the the greek word would be uh epitithemi, so to place upon and the practice of exposure which would be ectithemi, to kind of place outside to expose so the evangelist the, the language they've chosen the, the terminology they've chosen is kind of making that very stark contrast between jesus who sort of took children in his in his hands in his arms and put his hands on them to bless them and the practice of exposure which involved putting children out out of the house into the streets uh, as a sort of yeah as as baby moses was actually exposed on the on the river nile and it's the same that language that um verb ectothemia is used in Acts 7 where Stephen is kind of going through the whole of salvation history and is talking about Pharaoh's act of infanticide so in other words the early church would have said don't be don't be like Pharaoh don't be like King Herod um be like Jesus a protector of vulnerable children and the first Christians were known for their love for the weak for their love for the marginalized uh, including children if we if we kind of extend the frame a little bit further, we then have canons um, dealing with abortion from 305 AD. So they're the first time we, we read about these in sort of church canons, church sort of rulings, which treat it among the most serious of sins. Um, and that is extended some eight years later to those who prepare abortive fashion drugs. So not just people who underwent abortions themselves, but those who were responsible for um, making the drugs, essentially. Uh, the church, Father Basil the Great, unambiguously describes abortion at any stage of fetal development, so from conception, as an act of murder. And as Christian influence grew, of course, across the Roman world, abortion came to be seen not just as, you know, impermissible for Christians, but as dangerous um, to society as a whole, as, as bad for society as a whole. Um, so we want to be people that base our teaching our worldview on the bible of course we do that's what it means to be evangelical and the scriptures encourage us to respect the powers that be to obey where possible the laws of the land you see that in romans 13 probably classically but the government in romans 13 we are to obey is, is intended to do good not evil i think it's important to point that out in the text um you know, the the, the, the government um, has its power invested in it to sort of restrain wrongdoing and to promote good. Now, where government fails in that responsibility, we, 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 there's a tension, isn't there? And the Christian's ultimate authority is not to corrupt government, but to God. Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. Where there is a conflict in in ethical and in spiritual matters okay the powers that be wouldn't really distinguish between those and, and nor should we and you know we have to be realistic about this in very recent times our government has banned prayer 
in certain areas, uh, what, in fact, the areas where children are killed, is this a law we should obey as Christians? Now, I, I simply don't know, listening to listening to the Building Jerusalem podcast, I simply don't know how Stephen would respond to that, whether he thinks it's an unjust law, and if it is, whether whether we should resist it or whether we should still obey it. Because the Bible talks a great deal about unjust laws. Let me just read you two quick verses. Isaiah 10, verse 1. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression. Uh, Psalm 94, verse 20. Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statutes? So the Bible is clear that, that unjust rules, unjust laws will not stand before God. Like Pharaoh's edict, like his instruction to the midwives, we actually have an obligation um, not to uh, perform such unjust laws or decrees. You know, the, the midwives are praised for essentially not going along with Pharaoh's orders. And if you look at the history of, of, of kind of, or if you look rather at church history and how these things have been thought about, Augustine, you know, who's generally seen as a bit of a hero by most um branches of Christendom, Augustine wrote that an unjust law, in fact, is no law at all. And, and sometime later, Aquinas agreed with that judgment. And it's very interesting that Martin Luther King, when he was writing his letter from Birmingham jail, and if you haven't watched uh, Dave and Christian's pod on that, I would encourage you to do so because it's fantastic to, to hear those words um, that Martin Luther King wrote from in, from in prison. Um, he he sort of quotes both Augustine and Aquinas on the idea of there being such a thing as unjust laws um, as he's addressing the civil rights abuses that are raging across the southern United States. So our response to historic evils such as the slave trade, such as segregation, such as apartheid and, and now abortion is not, I would say, ultimately determined by the legality or not of such things in the eyes of the world. So, you know, the slave trade, the triangular trade, it was legal. It was all perfectly legal. Um, as was segregation, these were laws that had been passed uh, at state level, as was apartheid um, within South Africa. These were all things that were legal, but they were all things that were in direct contradiction of God's law and God's word. And if I'm honest, Beth, one of the things that troubled me most about the Building Jerusalem podcast was that the arguments that were used against us, against our ministry, if you like, our tactics, however they wanted to phrase it, the arguments that were used against us could equally be used, and in fact were used, against Christian campaigners fighting slavery, fighting segregation, fighting apartheid, you know, people like Wilberforce and others. And I wonder, Beth, maybe you could expand a little on that. So particularly kind of social reform from within the evangelical world. Things that um, we we don't want to be seen to be advocating, we're definitely not advocating for, is that it's an either or kind of thing. It, we're not saying that either the church must preach the gospel or it must be involved with social reform and we're saying that it's got to be social reform um but we see as you said great examples of um, pastors and preachers um in history who were called not called specifically to the sphere of social reform say like a, a william wilberforce um, and yet they believed that to faithfully preach the gospel meant to speak out against the particular sin of their age. And so it's we, we can talk about Wilberforce and people might say, well, actually, he was just living faithfully in his area, just like um, a teacher today might be living faithfully as a teacher. Wilberforce in Parliament was just living faithfully in parliament but it's we do see pastors and churches and preachers uh this isn't just individual people individual christians who are called specifically to social reform but uh we see um the church engaging with this issue not at the expense of the gospel not to dilute the message of the gospel but as an outworking as an overflow of their biblical worldview um 
it necessitates that they do confront the cultural idols. And so I think it's very important that as we preach the gospel, we challenge the idols of our day, uh, which necessarily has ethical implications. So just for some examples in history of very well-known people who did this, um, though slavery had already been abolished in, in England, Spurgeon still continued to speak out against slavery, particularly in America, in his sermons. Uh, and as a result, uh, there were Americans who were burning his sermons when he went over to the States. There were some Americans who were seeking to kill him because of his stance. Uh, and this wasn't him bending the gospel out of shape. I think that was perhaps some of the language that was used that by focusing on some of these things, um, we can, as it were, bend the gospel out of shape, not that it's a wrong thing, but that by focusing on it, it's taking it in, uh, putting too much weight on it, it's taking it in the wrong direction when actually that the heart of the gospel is um, the good news of Jesus Christ and, and these social implications are just peripheral issues. Uh, you know, we see Spurgeon saying, no, this isn't to bend the gospel out of shape or detract from the gospel, but because the gospel speaks directly to and challenges the idols and the sins of our age, we can't avoid confronting these issues if we are faithfully preaching the gospel. Uh, and so Spurgeon, <clears throat> though he was accused of removing those sections on slavery from his sermons that went to America, he very strongly upheld no because this is the truth of the gospel, it by ne ne necessity confronts the evil of slavery. Uh, or take John Newton. I, I mentioned about w William Wilberforce and how people might dismiss him because he was just doing his job, as it were. Uh, but John Newton, he was the ex-slave trader turned pastor. Um, he didn't see it as his duty just to preach the gospel, but he saw it um, as necessary to challenge slavery because he himself had failed to recognize his blind spot. He'd become a Christian and had remained the captain of a slave trip uh, ship. He recognized that this was a cultural blind spot and even Christians were failing to see the need to, to bring the gospel to bear on this issue. And so once he was awakened to this sin, once he was awakened to the great injustice that was happening in society, as a pastor, he couldn't remain silent. And he was the one who actually encouraged Wilberforce. Um, as a pastor, he counseled this man to change the law, to change, um, to, to remain in that position of power and to shape um, the, the government and, and the laws that were being made in order to protect the vulnerable, in order to um, save from harm these people who were being captured and sold and mistreated and abused um, and and because he recognized that this was the blind spot of the age he recognized that actually this was where the the gospel uh, needed to challenge the blind spot of those around not just in the church but outside the church as well so uh, just from some examples there are so many others that we can say you know um, in spite of some of in spite of the shortcomings and, and the sins um, of Martin Luther King Jr., um, you, you know, we won't go into um, adultery and all those kind of things, but we do see that the gospel coming to bear on um, segregation or Billy Graham speaking out against apartheid in South Africa um, because it was a gospel issue. And so to preach the gospel meant that he had to confront that sin and, and confront that injustice. And so when the Bible speaks on social issues or ethical issues, we've got to preach on, on those things. You can't remain silent. And um, I know of even just within Norwich, a church that would say that they are pro-life. And I listened to a sermon that they um, they presented on Exodus chapter one, where Pharaoh is, as you said, you know, um, telling the midwives to kill the children uh, and the practical implications for, for the church. There was no mention of abortion in that passage um, for, for the application for how this applies to us today when, you know, it's so, so clear in the passage um, 
you don't have to read this into scripture. It's there if we are willing to see it. And so when the Bible speaks on these issues, we have to preach on them. You can't ignore them. And and every generation faces a different sin. Um, and whatever that blind spot is, whatever that particular sin of the ages, the church is calling people to repent, warning against the moral and the spiritual blind spots. And I think that's that's very important that it's um, not to bend the gospel out of shape, but actually um, it's bringing the gospel to bear on the very particular idols of our day. Uh, so Tim, maybe you could talk more about how this what how this looks today. What what could this look like? Applying those biblical principles um, of in of dealing with injustice, of mercy um, to the cultural blind spots and the sins and the idols of our age. I I, I think I think it's exactly that. I think we need to realise that. As you say, the church in every age is confronted with unique challenges, um, which can also be opportunities, of course, for um, for growth, for outreach, for building the kingdom. And I think one of the things I'd say as well is that we see, again, if you look at the book of Acts, you see that often apologetics and evangelism kind of go hand in hand um, and oppo apologetic opportunities rather are, uh, you know, P Paul will always bring the gospel and Paul will always point to Jesus. Um, I'm thinking particularly, for example, say Acts 17, when he's when he's at Mars Hill and he's kind of engaging this sort of pagan worldview and pagan culture. And he's kind of it, 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 it's it's apologetic, really, but he gets the gospel in there. It all leads up to uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and there's other occasions in Acts where we see that very clearly. Um, so so I think this idea that that sort of there's kind of preaching the gospel and then there's something like what we're doing in terms of pro-life ministry pro-life activism and they're sort of completely decompartmentalized or sorry completely compartmentalized is is wrong i think anyone who's been involved in in say street display work um will know that that often conversations happen which lead to the gospel being shared which lead to those kind of weighty questions those weighty matters of you know life and death judgment um what does it mean to be a human being you know is there a god to whom we're going to give an account so it, it's a very natural platform actually for evangelism just as for example if you had a ministry like a, a pregnancy counseling ministry um again it's a natural platform to point people to to the hope to to the security of a relationship with with jesus so so again i think we want to stress that these are not sort of you know we are we see our ministry as part of the wider mission of god as part of what being a disciple means in 21st century britain and again i think i would want to really stress that you know this is possibly one of the most common sins that is going to affect people within the church but also people outside the church you do know, one in three women um, at some point in their lives will end a uh, pregnancy, will will kill their unborn child. And of course, no woman gets pregnant on her own. There's a man involved. So this is affecting a third of, of the people in our land. You know, how can we say that not addressing this is 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 something that isn't, you know, it, it's just to me, it's a no brainer, really. Um, but I think going back to the whole thing of the church can, you know, confronts different challenges and different idols in each age i think that's true and i think in the new testament period and the new testament writings are really wrestling with the identity of jesus you know is jesus the messiah is he the son of god was he raised on the third day and if so what does that mean you know how should we live how should we follow him if these things are true if we look at the debates that raged at the time of the reformation for example um that they, they are really debates around you know how does one know that they're saved you know how do you relate to god what's the relationship between the church the individual christian um what's the relationship between faith and works sanctification justification those kind of almost questions around the mechanics of salvation um and and the sort of outworking of the gospel 
I think in our age, in the twenty in the twentieth century, twenty first century, I should say, certainly in a in a kind of postmodern Western context, the issues that confront the church are primarily ethical and anthropological. And I think actually Dave wrote a, a piece in response to the whole Keswick thing that really helpfully stresses this. You know, we are not Christians generally are not going to, um, you know, are not going to face a lot of flack in society for their thoughts on the kind of, you know, niceties of, of Reformation theology, uh, the five solas or, you know, our view of baptism, that kind of those kind of questions that happened at the Reformation and, and the sort of period following the Reformation. What we are going to receive a lot of stick for and where we are going to see the kind of idols of the age coming out in all their ferocity is on ethical questions. So think homosexuality, think gender, um, think marriage and on anthropology. You know, what is it? What is a human being? And right at the heart of these kind of ethical and anthropological issues is the issue of abortion, which we would you know, see is, is really our, our version of child sacrifice um, in which we choose to sacrifice our own children for various idols of our own making, whether that's career, um, convenience, a relationship, reputation, um, whatever it may be. So, so, so many kind of kind of idols coalesce as, 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 as we've suggested in this thing called abortion. How can we not have something clear as the church, as God's people in the 21st century to say into, uh, to speak into that rather? Um, yeah. So, so let's not be let's not be naive. Let's you know we have to realise that these are the sorts of issues where we're going to face pushback. We're going to face confrontation. But let's also be confident that the church has good news on this issue. Um, we have good news for all society, including, of course, the unborn children who are, as I say, the overlooked victims. All that's always in this conversation. They're very overlooked victims. The church has good news. The church, you know, the message of the scriptures is for the whole of life from conception uh, to natural death. And it's for the whole of society. It's for every aspect of our interaction with society, not just what we do for a couple of hours on a Sunday or again, midweek at a Bible study. Let's let's start to believe and teach the whole counsel of God, as, as, as Paul puts it in Acts 20, verse 27. Let's not reduce um you know our understanding of the of of christian life even of the gospel to an almost almost quasi gnostic thing which is just between you know very private matter between us and god and has no bearing on how we live uh, the rest of our lives has no bearing on how we interact with society has no bearing on our political choices has no bearing on on you know essentially most 95 percent of our lives so yeah in a nutshell Beth, I think this is why this issue matters to us um, and why these sorts of issues have always mattered to God's people over the decades, over the centuries, really. Um, and we all know this. We all know the sort of heroes of the faith. We all hold them up, you know, the Bonhoeffers, the William Wilberforces, the MLKs. But then actually in our current day, sometimes it's harder to see, well, you know, where, where are our blind spots and how are we responding to them as God's people? Yeah, thank you for that, Tim. Um, I think it's so important to just remember how gospel and justice meet together. And we see that even on the cross, don't we? Just how the love of God and his justice um, meet, they kiss on the cross. And so as God's people, it's so important that we keep the two together, that we don't separate those out. Um, even when it's difficult, even when, you know, challenging the idols of the day will result in riots as in Ephesus or being um, verbally abused on the street if you're preaching faithfully or showing the reality of what um, so-called abortion does to the children uh, that are the victims. Uh, whatever it is, we need to be doing, doing this, speaking the truth in love revealing to people um, the reality of their sin, but also pointing them to Christ and to his forgiveness um, and to his goodness and his love. And so I think um, 
that's really what we're trying to say here is that um, being a gospel people doesn't mean that it's either or with social reform, but truly to be a gospel people, as you said, we preach the whole counsel of God, we challenge the idols of our day, and we faithfully um, stand up for those who cannot speak for themselves and reach out to the, the victims of these injustices. So I thank you for listening. Um, if you heard any podcast references that um, you haven't heard, listen to yet please do go back in our history and uh give those a listen um give those a watch um don't forget to like this video uh subscribe so that you can hear more podcasts coming out i think dave's got a very um interesting one coming up about eschatology and how that imp uh, is impacted by um social reform as well so if you want to be listening to that, do subscribe so that you can be notified when that comes out. Thank you for listening and bye-bye.